Okay, welcome back. Um, we just finished talking about the two choices for the user agent. And to tell you the truth, I'm not even sure why Pop is still around unless, of course, the idea is that maybe you have a very old machine that doesn't understand IMAP and therefore they have to keep it around for historic reasons. But I don't see anyone actually using... Even if I only had one, one PC, I probably still would not use Pop. Okay, on page 600, they talk about the anatomy of an email. And, uh, okay, there's an example there on page uh, 601, but come on, you know what, the, what these things look like. There's an envelope, okay, and the envelope is the thing that the MTA does for you. The MTA is, you know, the envelope used by the MTA to figure out, hey, do I need to put this on the wire or can I send it directly to the delivery agent? How do I do this, okay? There's headers, and, it, you know, there's a property value like, you know, to and from and subject, you know what we're talking about. There's nothing fancy here. And then of course the body of the document, which is of course, whatever the heck you're talking about. So the envelope is just, now the envelope could contain lots of routing information. Like the MTA sends it to another MTA, which sent it to another MTA, which sent it to another MTA, which sent it to another MTA. I mean, that could happen. Um, you know, like I, I can't imagine if I sent something to Microsoft.com, you know, Bob at Microsoft.com. It's probably going to go, I'm guessing, probably going to go through like four or five message MTAs before it gets to, you know, the particular division inside Microsoft where Bob's account really is. Okay, so the header, I'm sorry, the envelope part should show, hey, I got it and I sent it to this guy and this guy got it and I sent it to this guy and this guy got it, you know. So it could have a lot of trace information in there. So the simple mail transport protocol, that's the stuff that the MTA uses, the SMTP guy. Okay? Um, to tell you the truth, SMTP doesn't have that many commands. I mean, it's it's not much to it. Uh, hello is is the original one. You'd say hello, and it would say, hey, I'm a web server. How are you doing? And then they changed it to this new version, of uh, the enhanced version of SMTP. And so now it's, it's hello, but they've transposed some of the letters. Hey, go figure. Mail from receipt to verify. In other words, verify that, that this address is actually deliverable. In other words, if I send it to Bob at Microsoft.com, it's going to come back and say, I don't have anybody called Bob at Microsoft. So all, it doesn't actually check anything else. It just checks to see, right? Um, and then, of course, whether or not if there's any forwarding or other fancy stuff going on, the data, the quit, the reset and help. One of the things that's kind of weird is, see, I have mail from and receipt to. And don't you think it's a little weird that the subject thing is not really a command? Subject is the subject line is actually considered just part of the body. Okay, it's part of the data part. Okay, kind of weird. Uh, okay, so let's look at the error codes, the things that could happen when something goes wrong. So this is kind of cool because uh, if somebody has a mailbox that's deleted or a mailbox is full or a message is too big, da, 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 da. I kind of know some of these because it's, it's, it's useful when I get a bounced message coming back. Typically, it'll say, you know, you know, account no longer available or something like that, where the, you know, the, the unable to connect to that particular person's account because their mailbox is full. So typically, these things are kind of kind of different. The, the difference between a temporary one and a permanent one, those are kind of significant. If you get one that says, you know, mailbox disabled permanent, that means they probably left the company and, right, they're, no, you can't contact Bob at Microsoft anymore because he got fired. Okay, something like that. Okay. So the next thing we need to talk about on page 605, of course, is spam and malware. Um, so let me get a video going. This is kind of weird because you're you're already watching a video on YouTube, and now I'm going to have you have you watch a video on YouTube inside a video on YouTube. So it's a little weird, but just bear with me. What do you mean? I don't like spam. Okay, 
So, yes, the origin of the word spam is from a Monty Python sketch. Honest to God, that is crazy, but it's true. Okay, so let's talk about how spam gets through, all right? Um, remember we talked about uh, how you can, so the, the mail transport agent kind of thing, one of the things you can do is what's called a reverse lookup. So if the return address is not being used by an SMTP server, then you could probably say, wait a minute, this sounds a little suspicious to me. Um, the problem is that anyone can create their own MTA. I mean, it's free software. You could fire up you know, your Linux machine, create your own MTA, and then start firing stuff out to it, and it'll start you know, sending spam to other MTAs. Now, what'll happen is you'll probably end up getting blacklisted. Uh, if so, if, if you created an MTA that you know you were using for spamming, the other MTAs are gonna say, no, 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 we're not gonna take any, uh, any email from you again. All right, so they'll blacklist you. There's a thing called a sender policy framework. It's sort of like assurances that the sender is who they say they are. It does a reverse lookup. So the, to verify that the MTA that, that you say it's coming from actually is who they say they are. Uh, so the SPF is a technique of basically having a, having a way to verify that an MTA, if it says, my, I'm creating my own MTA, right? I can have the MTA say, oh, I'm Microsoft.com, right? But they'll do a reverse lookup on the IP address and go, the hell you are. You are not Microsoft.com at all, right? So a reverse lookup to see if your MTA is lying. Now, Microsoft has been trying to do this for quite some time. They've been trying to pursue this thing called a sender ID. And the idea is that Every person who sends an email really ought to have some sort of verification that they are who they say they are. And so, you know, in the corporate world, this is easy. In corporate world, you just digitally sign an email. You know, maybe I have a, a, a common access card or a token or something. Um, so I put in my CAC card and I digitally sign my email. And that means that, that anyone knows that uh, it absolutely came from me. It verifies who I am. So Microsoft has been working on this thing called Sender ID for years to come up with an identical kind of system for home use. We're not there yet, believe it or not, but we're there. Okay, on page 607, they start talking about privacy and encryption. Okay, so there's a, a thing called pretty good privacy. How's that? Pretty good privacy. Um, and this is used by uh, uh, lots of people. And the idea is that um, here's the thing that, that makes pretty good privacy unique. There is an awful lot of paranoia out there in the world with regard to encryption. A lot of people assume whether they're right or wrong is not up to debate, but they make the assumption that, you know, I'm not going to use encryption for, you know, Microsoft or whatever, because I think that the government has keys to be able to read my email, my encrypted email. Now, whether or not that's true, that's not really a, a, up for debate. But people believe it. And so what they wanted was an encryption routine, which they knew to be free of any government or company interference. And so pretty good privacy is now an open standard. It was written by one guy who had no government affiliation and no you know corporate affiliation. Now it's an open standard so that you can pretty much well be guaranteed if you're using an open standard encryption, that uh, no one has a secret back door on my encryption routine. Again, most of this is paranoid, but nevertheless. So for example, drug dealers use uh, PGP to encrypt their email to send to their, their folks. Okay, I'm just saying that's one of the examples because they fear the government might be able to read their unencrypted email otherwise. If you're not a drug dealer, maybe you don't care. Okay. Another one is called Secure Mime. Remember the Mime types, the multimedia thing? There's one called S-Mime, Secure Mime, which is a, a built-in protocol, and most all email clients understand that now. And uh, I, can, I can use all, believe it or not, S-Mime doesn't actually say which encryption type is being used. It just says this is encrypted, and here's enough information you need to know about it so it gets received at the other end so, the, so that the um, MSA, guy can unencrypt it or decrypt it, right? That guy. All right. So encryption and digital signatures. Let's talk about that for a minute. So 
in order for me to, if I want to send you a message and you want to verify that it came from me, I need some way of publicly ava make available publicly a set of keys that verify who I am. Okay, it doesn't work without making this public, so it's called public key infrastructure (PKI). All right, let me explain how this works. I um I have what's called a public key and a private key. Um, I sign something with one of those keys. I sign it with my private key. And then you can decrypt it with the public key that I put out there, okay? So you might think, well, what the hell would that do? I mean, if I, you're trying to tell me that anyone can in, to, could decrypt the message? Yeah. If I sign it with my private key and make my public key available in some PKI infrastructure thing, Yes, they can. Anyone could read the message. So you might be thinking, "Well, what the hell good is that?" What it does say is, it absolutely, positively came from me. So you don't, you're not encrypting for the purpose for keeping things secret. You're encrypting it so that everyone knows I'm the only one with my private key. So there's no way that anyone else could have sent that email. All right, that, that kind of makes sense. Okay. So that's how digital signatures work. Okay, so there's some other things that has to happen. Uh, I'm not gonna get into too much detail of that. Let's talk about aliases on page 608. So it's very common in a corporate environment that you have people's names, right? As email addresses, and then maybe you have company titles as an email address, like, you know, sales, right? Or engineering are a more ex a better example is when you get to a website and you have a, a web you know some in fact i don't even know if there's going to be anything down here at the bottom talking about you know I, I really don't know um i imagine there's something here where it says like contact or something well anyway let's just let's just assume that there was something here that said email um what they probably would send it to is is a fake or alias email address called webmaster and here's the idea. First of all, you don't need to know who the hell the webmaster is. If it's Bob or Sally, you don't need to know that. And further, what happens is in my company, uh, that rotates. Like, okay, this week it's Bob. You're going to be answering all the emails from that come in through the web server. And then next week, Sally, it's your turn to, to read all the, you know, handle all the emails that come in that week. And then it goes over to John, okay? So you want to rotate between three people you know, Bob, Sally, and John each have a week. Well, are you trying to tell me that every time you rotate this thing, you need to go out to the website and change the email address to Bob and then Sally and then John? Pfft, no. You keep it as webmaster. So webmaster at kumquat.com. And then behind the scenes, what happens is you just change the forwarding thing that says, oh, I want you to forward webmaster to Bob and then next week you just edit that file that forwards it to Sally and the week after that you edit that file and send it off to John so email aliases are like well it's used for forwarding it's just to reroute mail from one mailbox to another okay cool so a standard email like webmaster probably doesn't get sent to the same human every single time okay Another way of doing it is you could have a shortened, maybe maybe your email address is this long, okay? And, uh, you know, because you're using some corporate rules that say you have to have your full last name, but your last name's got 20 characters in it, and it's in some foreign language that I couldn't pronounce anyway. So maybe you want to have an, an alias that says Bob, okay? Even though your real email address is this big thing. That'd be another reason for using an email address. And then, of course, the last one is a mailing list. You could have... a uh, a thing say sales associates. So when you send an email to sales associates, it actually doesn't go to one person. It goes to five people's email addresses simultaneously, like a mailing list. Okay, we're coming up on the 15-minute mark. You know how this works.